All right, what's going on, guys? We are Loca Brewing LLC. I'm Matt Bolin. That's Mike Monty, Matt Lesher, Connor Reardon, and Alex Schneider. So, uh, the focus of our project is surrounding the uh, rise of non-alcoholic beer and craft breweries. Consumers are generally turning toward non-alcoholic options for a number of reasons, including general hate, uh, health concerns, specific health risks slash conditions, uh, recovering alcoholics, pregnant women, or religious reasons that prohibit alcohol use. There are uh, a number of social implications to craft breweries, such as uh, a sense of community and identity among the patrons. Uh, craft breweries attract all community members, tourism, and they promote small business growth within the community. Uh, craft breweries also have an inviting and sort of friendly atmosphere that uh, also sort of appears as a celebratory good in numerous social circles. So our problem statement is as follows. Uh, consumers are increasingly interested in reducing their alcohol consumption for personal, religious, and health reasons, but uh, substitutes for traditional alcoholic beverages are very limited. At the same time, the craft beer market has recently experienced an explosion in growth. So uh, we are to design a process that will help bring more diverse non-alcoholic craft beer options to the market. Uh, so some of our original ideas for delivering on that problem statement uh, kind of fell into two categories. Uh, one was modifications to the fermentation process uh, so that you produce less alcohol in the first place. Uh, there are a few ways to do that. Uh, one is using less sugar or fermentable material in the first place, uh, doing mashing at higher temperature to denature some of the yeast enzymes, uh, pitching cold yeast to slow down the reaction rate or quenching the reaction early so that you produce less alcohol. Uh, the other category is dealkalization of a post-fermentation process, so actually making beer with a full alcohol content and then using a separate process to take the alcohol out of it. Um, ways to do this include distillation and membrane separation, as well as dilution. So um, we essentially kind of decided not to go with the whole first category uh, because we want to deliver this to a diverse array of beers. That's kind of our, our goal. Um, and we don't want to create a new process that you need to use on one beer to make one certain way in one brewery. Uh, we want to deliver it to multiple breweries and multiple beers. Uh, so we decided to go with the dealkalization processes, specifically the distillation and membrane separations because dilution tends to give a worse tasting product. So with those selections in mind, we did a little more research. Um, on the membrane separation side, really what people were doing was reverse osmosis. Um, and we found some case studies that showed that this has been used to good effect, both in a Brazilian stout um, and in a uh, hard apple cider. It had brought the alcohol content down below 0.5%, which is the legal limit for a non-alcoholic beer. Um, and we saw that the stout ended up being really robust and um, could, it held up really well to processing, so we thought that might be a good beer to test. Um, and on the distillation side, we found kind of two methods used in literature. One is the prohibition method, which is essentially just boiling, um, boiling beer until the alcohol comes off of it, um, and vacuum distillation, which is essentially the same process, just done under vacuum so that you have to put in um, less heat and bring it up to a less temperature so you ruin less of the flavor compounds. So the only really viable options we found in our research were reverse osmosis and vacuum distillation. Uh, both of them we th felt that they would meet the problem statement well. Uh, however, we found that vacuum distillation uh, had been used a little bit more in the literature and was better documented and was also more analyzable by the tools that we had at our disposal, like Aston Plus. It was a little more prototypable and easier to scale up. So we decided to go with that for our design. So uh, I'm going to move to a little bit of proof of concept here. Uh, so we use Sam Adams New England IPA, which is a very hot forward beer, uh, and then Left Hand Milk Stout, which is a very malt forward beer. Um, and the purpose of this was just to um, verify that the flavor compounds in these beers would hold up under the temperature that we would be operating at under vacuum. Um, so obviously these temperatures will not boil off liquid on their own, but under vacuum they will. So we just wanted to see if the flavor profile would uh, retain under that temperature. Um, so uh, here we did uh, New England IPA. We did a little appraisal of it, unheated at 30 degrees and at 45 degrees C. Um, and unheated, that's just kind of the description of it right out of the box. And then unfortunately, kind of right off the bat, that 30 degree temperature did degrade a lot of those um, flavor profiles. So it wasn't very good. Um, and obviously worse, the hotter it got, so 45 degrees. Um, still kind of got a little worse. And I should clarify that this is not um, our bench scale. This is just uh, not under vacuum. This is atmospheric. We're just heating this beer um, to see how it holds up. 
And then we went to left-handed milk stout, and uh, as Connor kind of alluded to before, uh, the stout was a little bit more robust and held up to that temperature. So uh, at the 30 degree um, temperature mark, it was still uh, pretty viable, still tasted like a stout. Um, uh, when you got to 45 degrees, definitely something a little distinctly different, but with our taste panels that we ran, with people that didn't know what we were doing, um, the 30 degree was almost uh, indistinguishable from uh, the way that it comes out of the can. So that kind of proved that the stout would hold up, and uh, we had some high hopes for that, so we'll get into that in a little bit. So after these initial heating tests, we planned the design of a bench scale vacuum distillation skid to do some initial testing. So the first thing we did for this planning was perform a cave seal analysis um, for an ethanol water binary mixture across a couple of different vacuum pressures. And we found that the number of stages needed didn't really vary based on the intensity of the vacuum. Um, and we identified this as four ideal stages of separation to achieve the separation we're looking for. Um, and we were planning on doing this in a packed bed column as opposed to a traditional tray column because it holds up better to uh, high pressure systems. So we did research on HETP, which is the height equivalent of theoretical packing, just to get an idea for what heights we would need to achieve the separation. And uh, based on our research, we found that for the quarter inch diameter ratchet rings we planned to use, we would expect about 0.2 meters per separation stage. Um, also, based on our research, we were able to decide on an initial height to diameter column ratio of 1 to 24. So on the right here, you can see a picture of the uh, bench scale skid that we developed. So just uh, some highlights from the skid. Number one is uh, obviously the packed column that ended up being 0.6 meters or about two feet tall. We also have a jacketed boiler at the bottom here with a temperature control and stir plate. Um, our condenser can be seen at the very top right there, which for our bench scale we just oversized um, and then kind of refined it in Aspen later. Um, and then we also have our distillate collection drum, which we use to either collect distillate for testing or to reflux back into the top of the column. And then we also have three vacuum pumps in series to get down to the vacuum pressures that were desired and then a vacuum gauge to actually monitor our pressures during operation. So the first experiment we ran on this actually was not with a beer. We did a simple experiment with an ethanol water binary mixture. And this was a total reflux experiment where we were trying to just get an idea of the efficiency of our column versus the theoretical separation we thought we would achieve. Um, so we were expecting with our current setup to achieve four separation stages. And as you can see from the testing um, from this experiment, we actually only achieved about two. So we were looking at about 50% of our expected efficiency. Um, we still thought this was a pretty successful experiment because it showed we were getting multiple stages of separation, which we felt was good enough to continue testing gears on. Uh, and we just took this into account in our later designs and Aspen modeling. Uh, so that being said, once we kind of had a grasp on what our system could do, um, it was kind of it was time to test the beer. So again, we grabbed two beers that are kind of on the ends, the opposite ends of the spectrum um, in terms of what gives beer their uh, flavor. So we have New England IPA once again, um, very hop forward, um, very different compounds giving it flavor as opposed to the stout, um, which is very malt forward. Um, so these are kind of emblematic of two very different styles. So we decided to go with those. Um, and the ABVs are both a little bit above six, which is great, um, around 6.5 um, for both of those. IBU is kind of in the same ballpark too. IBU is International Bitterness Units, um, so it's just kind of a numeric way to um, compare beers in terms of their bitterness. Uh, and then our operating, operating parameters for both are relatively similar, um, the only difference being the pressures being about a 0.01 away from each other, but very high vacuum there. Um, and then we, same temperature and same duration of time just for consistency on these two tests. Um, yeah, so. Once we processed those, we had our kind of final, our, our product, um, and we analyzed it using three methods. So the first, what? <laughs> the tasting panels. Yeah, we gotta taste it, it's weird. Um, so we tasted it, obviously. Um, and once again, where do I work? Same Adam, so I know how to assess beer, and I taught these guys how to do it. So we sat around, and we were real snooty, and we uh, analyzed this beer pre-processing and post-processing, um, looking for things like um, color, haze, um, bitterness, aroma, things like that. Um, so we assessed it, 
And then uh, next we did uh, the, al the ethanol content. So um, someone that I've met through Sam Adams is uh, Bob Profit. He's a research and development brewer there. Um, they have a piece of equipment, which is pictured here on the right, it's called an alkalizer. And essentially it measures a bunch of things about beer, but the one thing that we cared about was the alcohol content, obviously. Uh, and then bitterness. So we use UV Viz um, to measure isohumulone, which is a good barometer of bitterness um, because you can kind of scale it to IBUs, those international bitterness units that um, we mentioned earlier. Um, so here we go, we're going to go through that taste panel that we went through. Um, so to be clear again, this is uh, with the processing, the graph that we heard, the table that we had before was no processing at all. So this is uh, under vacuum how things held up. So the same Adams New England IPA, uh, again, didn't hold up that well. We kind of predicted that this would happen because of uh, our initial test with the temperatures. Um, the color was different, the aroma was different, flavor was vastly different. You probably wouldn't know that it was an IPA uh, to start off with. It was uh, not good, to say the least. Um, but on the other hand, the Nightshade American Stout actually um, held up pretty well. So the flavors weren't uh, completely compromised. It was definitely a little bit different. If you drank them back to back, you'd notice a difference. But this was uh, the only one of the two that was actually enjoyable. So Boland actually had a glass of this and didn't hate yeah, it. So and it, was <laughs> it was fine. <laughs> Um, and this is the data that we got from Bob Profit with that alcoholizer. Um, so if you look on the left here, just that highlighted column, that's the alcohol difference. So um, both going from above 6 to below 2.5, it's about a 66% decrease um, in both cases. So not the legal limit that we were looking for of 0 0.5. Um, but again, we did this in our kitchen. So in the scale up, we were kind of hoping that we'd be able to process a little bit better, pull a better vacuum um, and hold this down. So and then the other thing on the right is just um, kind of indicative of the alcohol difference. It's just a calorie counter. Um, obviously, the beer is going to be lighter because we burned off some of that alcohol, but that's just a thing to keep in mind. It's kind of a way of qualifying for qualifying. Right, so the last test we did on these two beers were our UV Viz analysis to give us our international bittering units. So what you can see here is just the raw mm -hmm. absorbance value at 275 nanometers, which is where you can measure isohumulone once it's extracted. Um, and then that can be easily converted to IBUs. Um, but the real takeaway here is in the far right hand column, which is the IBU retention. So for the New England IPA, we saw about 90% retention of IBUs. And then for Nightshade, we saw almost 100% retention. And this is a good sign for us because um, while we lost some of the aromatic flavors in these beers, particularly the IPA, uh, we actually maintained um, pretty much all or most of the bitterness of both of these beers, which is a good sign. And we're thinking that we can kind of reintroduce the aromatic compounds through dry hopping, since we don't have to also worry about reintroducing bitterness. So with that proof of concept data in hand, uh, we took a look at designing a full scale system to, to do this process. Uh, so here's our process flow diagram. You can see it's a relatively simple process. It essentially consists of a vacuum distillation column uh, followed by an optional dry hopping skid that could be used depending on what style you're processing, um, kind of in the line Matt said to add some flavor back into beers that rely on a hoppy flavor. Um, something significant here is we have a full alcohol by volume bypass that never goes through any of the processing. Um, that's a variable fraction that will bypass the system so that we can get some flavor and the original properties of the beer back into the final product uh, without making the alcohol content go too high. Um, and this was originally sized to process the average craft beer um, composition, which is 6% alcohol by volume at uh, 950 pounds per hour. And that's, that flow rate is enough to process uh, 30 barrels, which is the average craft brew batch size, in an eight hour day. So here's just a little bit more detail for our PNID and some things I'd like to focus on for this. One would be um, just our control valves. So up here we have our feed control valve, which we actually designated as fail closed, just to not overflow the system if there's an issue with our feed. But um, all of our other control valves have actually been designated fail open, um, just to either prevent overpressure or overflow throughout the system. Um, as for our control setup, we kept a fairly simple uh, method of localizing our controls to each uh, specific unit. Um, and then some, I guess, takeaways for this control system is we also have a few instances of ratio controlling. One is for the feed bypass that Connor has described. You can see this on our three-way feed valve. And then we also have flow ratio control in our distillate collection tank to just decide how much we're refluxing and how much we're collecting as our liquor byproduct. So uh, with that in mind, that process, we tried to build a Aspen Plus simulation to get an understanding of how it would work in real life. Um, we picked a processing pressure of 0 0.038 atmospheres absolute, which is um, 
feasible based on what's done in industry, especially in the oil industry where they do vacuum distillation for refining. Um, at that processing pressure, the bottom's product, the, the beer, um, only gets up to a temperature of 24.2 degrees C, so on the scale of room temperature, which is one of our goals because we didn't want to heat up the beer quite as much and damage the flavor. Um, the simulation suggested that we're going to need eight equilibrium stages to, to get the separation we need, uh, where the feed is being sent in above uh, stage five. We found that we're going to need a two diameter column, so the bottom of the column would be about one foot in diameter and the, the top would be 0.85 feet. Uh, we would have liked to have one diameter for the column because it's cheaper and easier to manufacture, uh, but for hydraulic reasons, the differences in flow rates above and below the feed I ended up needing the two diameter column. Um, and lastly, including the, the packed bed itself and the reboiling condensers, we thought this would be about 15 feet tall, which will fit nicely to the building we chose. So these are the separation profiles for the main components, water and ethanol. Um, really the goal when you look at these is to not have really flat regions because um, you're kind of wasting stages and not getting separation there. So what that means is we get kind of flat in the four and five range, so we could have prob possibly had the feed at the four, fourth stage or the fifth stage, um, but the fifth ended up being a little better for the simulation results. And also it gets a little flat out towards stage seven and eight but we ended up needing those stages just because we're getting down to a really low bottoms concentration of ethanol, so we needed every stage uh, to count. On the hydraulic side, back to that diameter discussion, uh, when we have different diameters above and below the feed, uh, we get good hydraulic results. Uh, we're below the maximum recommended vapor pressure drop for a packed bed um, and above the minimum recommended flow rate for every stage, so it suggests that for the nominal case, the hydraulics will work out and the column will actually function physically. And lastly, we did a little <coughs> analysis uh, because we want to use this on a variety of beers, and craft beers aren't all 6% alcohol by volume, which could be a range, so we wanted to take a look at whether the same system could was robust enough to process a 3% alcohol by volume and a 12% alcohol by volume beer. Um, and we found that it was successful in reducing any of those feed compositions down to 0.5% uh, by varying three pretty easy to change operating parameters, including the, the, the feed bypass, the reflux ratio, and the rate at which we were drawing to slow out of the system. It would, it would work for pretty much any beer concentration. Now, considering our fully developed process, uh, as you saw from my, uh, the PNID, there's a number of safety systems we had in place uh, that we put in there initially when we were designing it. And we implemented this uh, failure mode and effects analysis, which eff uh, effectively evaluate our overall process in terms of possible failures and their subsequent impacts on the system. And we determined the uh, most critical failures and address them with further correction as a group. Uh, so the way we uh, uh, basically characterize these failures was on a level of one, five, or nine. So depending on the severity, occurrence, or detection, uh, we multiplied those, and if the number or the RPN, the risk priority number, was above 45 or 45 or above, then we got together and said, okay, this something else needs to be uh, put into place. One of those, uh, one of the main critical failures was surrounding the column reboiler. Uh, the, these failures had a high RPN due to higher severity, low occurrence, and moderate detectability. Our initial uh, safety um, integration was this relief valve. Um, which allowed our, uh, uh, which made our occurrence rating lower, but again it was 45, so we had an independent pressure alarm to increase that detectability. And our next uh, was the distillate co uh, collection drum. Uh, if there was an electrical failure, that might have led to a transmitter controller failure, resulting in an overflow of ethanol since we weren't monitoring it uh, out of the reflux drum. That would expose the surrounding area to flammable process fluid, and if there's an electrical source there, possible ignition and explosion. Uh, we initially put some dikes and flammable vapor detectors in the base case design, um, but again, it was a RPN of 45, so we added sprinklers and plant emergency responses to decrease that severity of the explosion potentially. All right, so just a brief SDS overview. So. What we focused on here essentially is ethanol, which is um, one of our byproducts. And as you can see from the fire diamond in the top right, ethanol is flammable, uh, both as a liquid and a vapor. So some main concerns here, uh, one of them is with firefighting. We definitely do not want to rely on a solid water stream to put out any ethanol-based fires. 
So we made sure we had the appro appropriate flame retardants for ethanol in our site. And then another um, design concern was with our engineering controls. We made sure we had explosive proof ventilation to handle ethanol. And we also made sure our facility was fit with eyewash and safety showers to deal with this hazard. And then another hazard identified that we just wanted to discuss was um, steam or steam jacketed reboiler. So a few safety considerations for steam. Um, one easily overlooked one is actually uh, slips and falls due to condensation from the steam. And then another more severe one would be potential for burns. So we're gonna make sure we address both of those in our design. All right, on to um, the business plan. So the first thing we had to do is, even if we're making this process, like, is there really a demand for non-alcoholic beer? Um, I think some of us were skeptical at first, but after looking into the numbers, there really is a market for it, it really is growing. So here we're gonna look at the craft beer market. Um, first off, um, this, this data is from 2017, but it still tells the story here in 2019 as well. So overall beer sales um, nationally and globally are actually down, and this is consistent in 2019 as well, down over 1% in 2017, while craft beer is still growing at a significant rate. Um, so craft beer is growing, big beer is dying down, so how can we really look to combine craft beer, the growth of craft beer, with the market opportunity that non-alcoholic beer brings. So non-alcoholic beer is also growing at a very significant margin. Um, compound annual growth rates of over 7% projected for the next six years. Um, and this is really just backed up by even by what big beer is saying publicly um, to different media outlets. AB InBev, the largest beer manufacturer in the world, projects almost a fifth of its sales in the year 2025 to be from low or non-alcoholic beers. And even Carlsberg, the giant over in Europe, expects alcohol-free beer revenue to grow three times faster than overall beer sales. Um, so we really look to combine those two to make a profitable product for these craft brewers. Um, so we are going to set up as an LLC to limit liability of us as owners, and also allow us to bring in other ownership members, more as owner investors, um, and we can be more of the owner operators in the system. Um, in terms of marketing and sales, um, this is actually really genius here because we are just a post-processing partner or a CMO that the breweries are going to use um, to post-process their beer. So actually the marketing and the distribution systems used are going to be of the existing craft breweries themselves, so we don't have to deal with that. So here's a little bit of our supply chain. So craft breweries are going to just do business as usual. This will not affect the brewer in any way. Um, so they're going to keep producing their beer the way that they already do. But before they keg it, they're going to obviously have it in the barrels that they produce it in. Uh, then we're going to send our trucks over to these breweries, pick up their beer, bring it to us, uh, go through the processing, get it below that 0.5 alcohol uh, percentage that we're looking for. Then we're going to bring it back um, and give it to the craft breweries. And they are essentially just going to do their distribution as usual. Um, so we're pretty minimally affecting what they do. Um, and then, so we had to pick a location for this. So we looked um, at states um, all across the country in terms of uh, where are the most craft breweries, where are people drinking the most craft beer, and where are people uh, drinking the most non-alcoholic beer. Um, so all those things considered, um, we chose Pennsylvania. There's a ton of craft breweries there, a lot of people um, over the age of 21 um, moving there, so we thought that was great. And we picked this Brownfield site uh, in Reading, Pennsylvania, which used to be a Denny's. Um, has a really big ceiling um, to fit all of our unit ops in. We can fit our distillation columns in there. Um, it's fitted for all the uh, electric stuff that we need um, and the ventilation. So that's that. Not the restaurant. <laughs> Not the restaurant. No, I mean, it still is a Denny's, though. You can't, you can't deny that it is a Denny's. <laughs> um, so looking at capital costs really quick, um, some of our biggest costs are going to be the distillation column, uh, the tank truck for shipping, because we are doing shipping internally, because this is a novel product. Um, and I guess the site itself, um, which we are planning on buying. Um, so just looking at the major process equipment, uh, the biggest cost is going to be our vacuum distillation column with an installed cost of over $500,000. Um, we did um, depreciate all of our equipment here, um, straight line method, um, and depending on the estimated life um, time of the piece of equipment, it did vary, um, but at the end of, end of life of each um, piece of equipment here, we did assume that book value would be zero. Um, so how much can we actually project to charge reasonably on a reasonable basis um, for this post-processing that we are doing for these breweries? Um, so breweries actually make much more of a profit by selling non-alcoholic beer, um, just in general, just because they don't have to pay alcohol taxes um, to rather be federal or state authorities. Um, so it's actually estimated that they make almost 50% more on a six pack sold in a liquor store than if it was an alcoholic beer comparable, right? 
Um, so if we just took that 50 cent number and that's what we charged um, to these breweries, um, we aren't profitable, which is unfortunate. So if we increase that number by a little bit, um, times four, we would be charging over $3,000 per batch. And even if breweries were to just pass on this extra added amount to customers themselves, it would only um, tack on about $1.50 per six pack to the consumer. And since this is a novel product, um, I think this is something, 25 cents a beer, something that consumers would be willing to pay. And of course, we do have an alcoholic byproduct that we weren't able to do as much market research on. Um, this would be more of like a whiskey beer, um, 40 to 55% alcohol, um, other post byproduct that we could return back to these breweries um, for possible sales. Um, because we will be returning it back to them, we don't have much of a waste stream. Um, this is really our only other byproduct out of our system. And we weren't really able to get much of an economic um, estimate on what we could charge, so we just estimated a base value of $500 per batch. So now we're gonna look at the cost of production associated with this process. Um, we are at a full operational basis, assuming we are running 400 batches per year. Um, we will be charging again over $3,000 per batch. And again, no waste streams because of our byproducts also being sold back to the breweries. And raw materials, the breweries are actually providing raw materials to us um, with their beer. Um, so there isn't much in um, cost associated with that as well. So our gross margin um, on a yearly basis will be almost $1.5 million. And cost of production are mostly utility costs associated with electricity. This was also tough to estimate because we don't know how much or how efficient our process will be at retaining vacuum. Um, this is something tough to estimate in Aspen or tough to estimate without experimentation on site. Um, so much of our cost does come from this electricity cost as well as other fixed operating costs like labor, maintenance, and overhead. So after taking these revenues and these estimated costs, um, we are projecting gross profits of over $600,000 on a yearly basis. Um, now projecting this over the lifetime of the project, we are estimating that the first year will be construction and setup. Year two, we will be half operational. And then we will have 20 years of fully operational plant life from years three to year 22. And after looking at our discounted cash flow analysis, uh, we are expecting an IRR of 10.06% on a 20-year basis, as well as a positive MPV and a simple payback period of 10 years. All right, so just as a quick recap, we're planning on delivering a diverse array of non-alcoholic craft beers to markets uh, through a vacuum distillation method, and we'll be acting as a CMO, partnering with existing breweries for this endeavor. Um, we've already completed some proof of concept and small scale prototyping designs and we've successfully uh, modeled this at full scale in Aspen. And based on these analyses and our economic analysis, uh, we expect an annual gross profit of over $600,000 and a 20 year IRR of over 10%. Now we wanted to give some thanks to people who have helped us along the way. Uh, first of which, Bob Prophet, the R&D brewer at Sam Adams uh, for providing us with the alkalizer. Professor Willie for uh, his help with gas chromatography and safety considerations. Professor Fluger for her general guidance and instruction. Nicole Bassers for her help uh, when we analyzed our samples using UV Viz. Uh, Tyler Underhill, our mentor uh, for plant design considerations. And Rob Egan for general capstone lab assistance. Um, so in the scale up, we'd be accounting for the higher vacuum that we'd be able to pull, which would theoretically allow us to pull alcohol off at a lower temperature, kind of preserving that uh, flavor profile. Um, but as far as uh, the two ends of the spectrum that I was mentioning, the really hop-dependent beers and the really malt-dependent beers, 
Um, we kind of all agree that the uh, more hoppy beers are going to be very difficult to process from research and through uh, what we found in our proof of concept stuff. Um, so those are going to be difficult to kind of figure out, but I actually do think that the more malt forward beers, like porters, stouts, um, like Hefeweizen, and things like that, would actually probably um, be kind of viable in the market, um, especially once we scale up. Um, because we made something that was uh, like not to say consumable, like health wise, they're both consumable, but something that's like palatable um, in our kitchen. So if we had, a, if we scaled up, I actually think that would be pretty good. And then additionally to that, um, so as Alec mentioned, there is a lot of uh, styles we would feel confident with right now, but we actually didn't have um, the time yet to do those dry hopping experiments that we wanted to do after processing the IPA. But based on the uh, results, we found that like the bitterness was intact, and we really do think the loss there was basically aromatic compounds from the hops. Uh, we're hoping with some initial testing and optimization of our dry hopping skid, we'll be able to actually make those more apples to apples as well. Um, and actually, to add more onto that, uh, just to clarify what dry hopping is, you just basically take a beer and you just leave like uh, pe like pelletized hops in it. Um, and it kind of just draws the compounds out. If you just think of like the same concept as like putting a tea bag in water, it just pulls the flavors and the sugars out. So it's the same kind of deal. Yeah, for that initial study where you heated up the beer in 30 to 45 cc, can you just talk about that study a little bit? Like how long did you heat it for and like who were its subjects and how you kind of talk about that? Yeah, so um, we had essentially the boiler that we used for the distillation column. We had like a, a tank, a small tank, and we had a heated jacket and we heated them up. We had a temperature controller. Uh, so we let it get up to the target temperature and then we left it there for about an hour. Um, and then we took it out, cooled it down to like a drinkable temperature. And then we tasted it ourselves. We weren't blind, but we also, the, the house we were doing at, we had some other roommates to taste the three next to each other. And like Alex said, the, the IPA you could definitely tell had been processed, but um, the stout, the 30 degree stout and the unprocessed stout, people had a hard time differentiating between. So it went well. It was a pretty simple experiment just to get an idea. Bible temperatures. Can you go to the alkalizer analysis slide? The data or the okay, yeah. There's the RDF, the like real degree of fermentation. So mm -hmm. does that mean like if you just stop fermenting the beer at sixty seven percent of what it is now, you get the same result? Um so the RDF I will say in this case is not really um, a useful measure uh, because that has to do with Beer that you're fermenting with yeast, and it kind of you need a almost a pre measurement to kind of a pre measurement of the, uh, the sugars, um, pre measurement of the sugars before you kind of understand what that means. But with our case here, um, we didn't ferment, so we kind of throw off that number. You know what I mean? Because of the we're cooking things that are used um, to kind of get this number, so it kind of throws that off and makes it kind of um, useless for us. But in terms of when they use that number, yeah, that, that is what they do um, for really. And yeah, you see like the out of the bottle number is a hundred percent. So like it's kinda hard to do an apples to apples like uh, for post processing, how much of a volume loss did you have in the process you have idea about? The amount of distillate we were getting out, I don't think we ended up we didn't have kind of a large enough um, volume measuring tool to get the volume of the beer, but the alcohol the ethanol concentrated that we we're getting out was maybe like 50 mils, so, so and we yep, started so with a six yeah. pack, so not a whole lot. Okay. And that's part of the reason, like you, you could just do a vacuum still, like just like one separation stage, like a drum, uh, but we wanted to have some stages because you get a lot of water loss if you don't have a distillation column. Any other questions? Yeah, so can you, don't sit down yet, can you go back to your PID? Sure. Boy. <clears throat> There's a valve on the vessel called D101 at the bottom. How does that one fail? You said all valves D1 fail except one. Fail all fail. That's a sand, That's a manual valve. No, no, that one right there. This oh, one? That's RV1, you mean? Yeah, did that fail? Oh, open RV1? Open? That's, uh, uh, that's actually a relief valve? No, no, no. The, uh, what's that say? V4? V2? Four. Oh, that's, that's V4. That uh, yeah. fails open as well. So that would just be, this um, basically leads to just a holding tank where we would, in, in a, yeah, where we would collect it under normal processing conditions until we were ready to ship it back to the brewery. Okay. So if it failed, it would just go to that holding tank. Yeah, we're more interested in ruining the product and filling up the whole system. 
Okay. Some of the customer problems. Uh, another thought occurred to me there would be a market for your distillate. Yep. And did you include that in your? Yes, so that was included, um, though in a lesser capacity, it was tough to get, I guess, economic data on what we could really charge and what breweries could actually get in return. Yeah, this you're yeah it's a really yeah, good yeah. product. People, people have been yeah. selling like beer whiskey, so like it's yeah. Yeah. concentrated ethanol made from beer, but we don't really have numbers. All right. We also drink it. Yeah, if anyone's curious about that. It was, it was, it was, it was bad. No, no, no. Definitely. No, for sure. I'm so weird. So weird. <laughs> 50 ml could be deadly. Yeah, it was, like, it was like 40%, I think. <laughs> yeah, well. Well, I mean, it was from beer. It still got methanol. Yeah. It was only like 40, 50% coming out. It's like a Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you only live once. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh -huh. Get well. Thank you. We did well. <laughs>